Oh, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, and just wanted to give a um, brief welcome um, before we get started. And um, this is the Uncomfortable New Clothes, um, Policymaking and Religion in Europe, um, co-sponsored by the Baker Institute Student Forum, um, which of course I am president of. Um, I'm Lauren Baba. And then also want to get um, a lot of credit to the Bonniac Center for Religious Tolerance, who have helped us make this um, possible. So. Um, Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Party. And um, I guess that brings me to um, the introduction for our keynote speaker. Um, one of our student forum members actually um, recruited uh, Dr. Oliver D for this event. Um, so Daniel Brubaker, a PhD student at Rice, will be doing the introduction. Thank you very much. It's, uh Really a pleasure to uh, be able to have uh, Dr. Oliver D to uh, come all the way across the water and join us tonight, and I hope you'll enjoy uh, his talk. Um, Dr. Oliver D is a scholar uh, on the interaction uh, between Islam and Europe, uh, mainly at the governmental level. Um, he's currently in the interreligious advisor for the Archbishop of Canterbury's representative to the EU, uh, and he's the associate researcher for the London School of Theology. Uh, so accordingly, he divides his time between London and Brussels. Uh, uh, getting over to Brussels, uh, he tells me about once a month. Um, and additionally, just two weeks ago, he was also appointed as the interreligious advisor to the Bishop of Peterborough. And if you have questions about what that means, uh, don't ask me, ask him. Uh, uh, Dr. Oliver D is the author of two books, The Caliphate Question, British Government and Islamic uh, Governance, and the forthcoming Muslim Minorities, Citizenship, and Sharia, as well as numerous articles and journals uh, for journals and media. Among his main academic interests are citizenship and identity, human rights, and religious freedom. It may seem uh, a little bit unusual, I, I know, to uh, have a speaker at the Baker Institute uh, Public Policy, a uh, representative of a religious uh, organization such as the Church of England. Uh, particularly on the topic of Islam. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. D has mentioned that he is sometimes asked by uh, his uh, colleagues uh, within the church why he is doing uh, what he's doing, uh, being so interested in being involved with the EU. And uh, he said he's answered them, why would I not be? Um, it's very important to pay attention to these issues uh, from whichever uh, angle, and especially issues uh, one of the reasons this is being co-sponsored by uh, the Boniac Center is issues of uh, religious um, uh, freedom and uh, equality are, are important uh, not to skirt. And in fact, uh, European governments uh, are frequently not excluding the UK, uh, but not, not limited to the UK, have historically made uh, some important missteps uh, regarding handling of issues of religion uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and sometimes this has unfortunate outcomes. So it might come as no surprise uh, that policymakers are often, on the one hand, uh, fearful or unsure, uh, or on the other hand, dismissive when it comes to uh, matters of religion. Um, religion and religious identity, uh, religious worldviews, however, lie at the heart of many conflicts in the world, uh, even right now, and uh, certainly throughout history. Um, so, you know, the task of navigating the complexities of it, sometimes policymakers are a little bit fearful of going into this realm, uh, right? It can be very daunting. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, many policymakers feel that it's, uh, you know, it's really peripheral, that religious uh, issues are really kind of a foil for uh, economic uh, motivations or, or uh, other social uh, motivations for things. Um, yet those of us, you know, I, I work in religious studies, and uh, as, uh, as does Dr. Oliver D. Um, we work with religious texts and history, and we do understand that uh, matters of theology and, um, and those related things uh, actually are very deep motivators for people uh, in their actions, and therefore shouldn't be ignored uh, in that. Okay, so I won't make any further comments. Uh, I'll just... Uh, Hope that you will uh, enjoy hearing what uh, Dr. Oliver D has to say. He will be answering some questions at the end, so if you uh, something comes to mind, uh, remember it and be sure to ask him that. Join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Uh, okay. 
So the subject before us this evening is <clears throat> uh, the uncomfortable close, religion and policy making in Europe, uh, particularly the EU. I'm uh, unsure of my ground as to sort of how much people will know over here about the institutions of the EU. And so I thought I would just give a very brief uh, overview of some facts and figures just about the European Union in general, but also uh, about uh, particular issues that are going on uh, in Europe before I get sort of meat of what I'm saying. You can see uh, thrown up on the wall there uh, a map of Europe which shows <clears throat> the countries which are presently part of the EU itself. And uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, Europe as a continent extends through to uh, Russia and right the way through to Portugal on the other side. Um, there are gaps particularly in the Balkans and uh, to the Russian satellite states where uh, the EU has not yet uh, got membership, but uh, it is rapidly expanding to the east and the idea is that as much of the continent as possible is included within the EU at uh, a future date. Indeed, um, <coughs> One of the particular issues that Europe has uh, going forward, uh, which I'll come to later, uh, is um, the particular input that Turkey will have in the future. Some facts and figures uh, just about the continent to get us thinking. Um, <clears throat> GDP of Euro in 2010 was approximately 14.9 trillion, which makes it the largest single economy in the world. But within that, there's huge variations between uh, the West and the East in terms of expectations, in terms of incomes, etc. Birth rate is an issue uh, in Europe, as it is uh, elsewhere as well. And the average birth rate is very low indeed in Europe, and particularly in France, as you can see, has the lowest birth rate there. Currently, the population of Europe, uh, according to the UN, uh, is uh, around about 857 million, which is 14% of the world's population. And uh, 570 million of those are within Europe itself, uh, the EU itself. Perhaps surprisingly, uh, given partly what I shall be saying later, um, <coughs> there is actually a, a net uh, emigration from Europe currently rather than migration to Europe. Put the figure on there, according to uh, the EU's own uh, statisticians, it's 6% immigration as compared to 13% immigration. Within that, although the uh, composition of Europe is uh, going, undergoing a huge change ethnically, um, <clears throat> there are also um, what it seems to be a continuous downward slide in terms of uh, belief in some form of God. Uh, religiously, uh, as it says, point E there, about 54% of Europeans claim to believe in a God and a further 25 in some form of spirit world. 21% currently describe themselves as atheists. However, there are some variations on that, those statistics. And uh, later, um, I have some uh, stats on uh, the number of people uh, saying that they're Christian, uh, Muslim, etc. And those um, belie slightly the figures that are, uh, I've given out there. But these are official uh, stats according to the EU. Mm. According, um, as a result of the ongoing enlargement process, of course, the EU's membership now includes many of the former Soviet Balkan states, uh, in such as Poland, Slovakia, and <coughs> uh, some of the Baltic states as well. And that has really been since uh, the 2004 or 5 that those have uh, come online. I think it's important when assessing and understanding the nature of uh, the European Union and its relationship with religion that we just take a brief look at it, the historical context. And there is no doubt that the European Union has, and uh, the Europe as a continent, before that has had a somewhat turbulent relationship with religion in public life. Indeed, since uh, the Middle Ages, uh, when there was the tussles between the Holy Roman Emperor and Pope Gregory IX, uh, as well as throughout the Reformation period, uh, when the conflict has been open and frequently bloody, there have been tensions between what the secular rulers were demanding and what the papacy uh, felt that it should have a right to. 
<coughs> particularly uh, the issue uh, um, between um, state and faith has revolved around the extent to which an individual ruler can control its own welfare issues and the extent too to which the instruments of the state should be used to uphold religious belief. It's said that over a period of about 500 years, uh, the public space was gradually taken over by the state at the expense of the church, to the extent that by the time of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution in the late 18th century, the church was being increasingly driven into the sphere of private belief. One of the sort of major steps upon that road uh, was taken, for example, by uh, the British monarch Henry VIII, uh, 1537, who established himself at the head of the church for precisely the reason of controlling the public space in a way that his predecessors had been unable to do. The seal was set on this uh, increasing uh, role of the state in public life uh, by the creation of the new state of Italy in 1865, which finally boxed the papacy into the Vatican City, removing the temporal power it had also enjoyed as the ruler of the papal states. In fact, the earlier part of the same century had also seen the first of many agreements between the church and the state, which had attempted to delineate the extent of the church's power. For example, Napoleon Bonaparte had uh, signed a concordat with the papacy in 1804, which had attempted to limit the extent to which the church could be involved, particularly in education, uh, within France. Indeed, the French were at the foremost of this uh, forefront of this limiting policy. Uh, the French law of church and the separation of church and state of 1905 uh, sought to enshrine this dynamic in statute in a way that had been informally agreed uh, during uh, previous centuries. It might be said that the drive towards uh, privatization of faith moved at differing rates across Western Europe. And in general, the Protestant churches were quicker to limit the power and influence of the church than the Catholic countries. This perhaps is not surprising given the nature of Protestantism in its early phase. Um, <clears throat> and some uh, countries, Catholic countries, uh, such as Spain, have um, moved uh, towards secular li liberalism uh, relatively late in comparison to other European countries. However, what this church-state tension has done has sort of fueled what might be described as a, as a siege mentality amongst the liberal elites of the new governing classes that has essentially sought to keep religion out of the public space for fear of its spreading influence once again. That said, uh, that does not mean that the European powers have not tried to use religion for their own ends. British and other European powers have used, for example, pan-Islamic ideology to their own ends over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. And one might argue that in other powers have done that since. Perhaps the uh, intervention in, in Afghanistan against the Soviets would be a, another example of that. Despite the uh, la cité of both individual EU powers and the EU itself, the advent of migration, terrorist atrocities, and questions about identity have forced religion out of the box that it had been neatly placed in and back into the public domain. It has come at exactly a time when Europe is doing a lot of changing anyway. Europe is restless in a way that it hasn't been since the mid-18th century, when a population explosion and an urbanization caused, industrial and in, uh, caused by industrialization caused a series of riots in the street of Europe capitals, as well as the mass migration that entrenched European culture into the far-fung places of the world. I would argue that there are two principal catalysts. The first is the effect of increasing federalism coupled with economic woe. The other is mass migration, and in particular, the impact of Muslim migration, uh, immigration. Statistics are hard to come by, but it is generally reckoned that about 5.12% of the total population of Europe are currently Muslim. 
The problems of the economic downturn are well documented, and I'm not going to spend time discussing the impact of them here. Federalism and immigration will both be discussed later, as they were, I would argue, part of the same package. However, before getting to these elements, it's important to take a look at the major development in, in the relationship between the EU and religious groups. The biggest single step in the engagement of religious groups and the work of religion in the EU more broadly came with the Lisbon Treaty. The treaty, which was finally ratified in 2009 and essentially provides for the basis for a federalized state with its own dip diplomatic core, contains also the provision of a legal base for dialogue, basis for dialogue between the EU institutions on the one hand and religious representatives on the other. The wording of the treaty itself has been the subject of intense debate amongst various Western European powers. Germany and Italy had been the strongest voices in favour of including a reference to Europe's Christian heritage. But this had been vigorously resisted by the French in particular, with loud cries of assent from Denmark and Sweden. The British, as might be expected, held a somewhat middle ground and uh, <clears throat> argued that if Christianity was mentioned, then other faiths would need to be mentioned as well. After intense wrangling the constitutional, uh, over the constitutional treaty, it was decided not to include any direct reference to Europe's Christian heritage as the source of its common values. However, the role of religion in European society was eventually referenced for the first time in EU primary law in the final bill. Article 17, which is up on the wall there, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union um, read as you can see on the board there. The dialogues that are enshrined in that document have been conducted on an informal basis for a number of years and has evolved to include annual meetings of the presidents of the three main EU institutions with religious leaders on issues of EU policy. Topics on which faith leaders have been consulted at these gatherings include climate change, the financial crisis, combating poverty, and social exclusion. For that reason, religious NGOs, uh, representations, and think tanks have vigorously stepped up their work with the institutions. <coughs> Particularly active have been Muslim groups, whose recent European Muslim Charter has been designated or designed, if you like, to be an outreach tool to the institutions in relation to policy making. The continuing work on the agenda and development of these discussions has been passed to the Bureau of European Policy Advisers, known as BIPA, under the uh, chairmanship of President José Manuel Barroso. Outside of these constitutional discussions, there are three areas in which the EU is having to assess the um, impact of religion in. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, is the accession of Turkey. The European Union has had a formal relationship with Turkey since 1959, but is yet to grant membership status to it. Many policymakers, particularly the French and Germans, are concerned about the cultural impact of bringing such a populous and comparatively wealthy Islamic state into the EU for the first time. For that reason, it spent considerable time working on its European Neighbourhood Policy, the EMP, which has sought to develop in all candidate membership states the robust representational institutions that will create the kind of lasting democracies that it feels are currently lacking. The most recent report on, of the EU on Turkish accession, which came out in December 2010, um, highlighted a need to go further down the road of in social inclusion, including religious rights of minorities. Not surprisingly, the Turks are getting increasingly frustrated with the whole process. This political conditionality, as it's known, uh, that the EU is pursuing in relation to Turkey is at the same time causing much discussion amongst the institutions about the wider use of political conditionality in relation to development aid. The EU has become one of the largest donors of overseas aid in the world. As a consequence, the very nature 
of the places that the aid is going to dictates that a level of engagement with religious issues and a level of religious literacy uh, <clears throat> is required. For example, the uh, development assistance that has been offered in cases such as uh, Lebanon, Algeria, and to Indonesia, all of which are Islamic states, are at the moment unclear as to their policy goals in relation to the political institutions that are desired. Also, there is a discussion as to whether this is a legitimate um, thing to be asking in a state that not, does not have a Judeo-Christian background. So consequently, there is a major discussion going on within the External Action Service, or the EEAS, and the Commission as a whole concerning whether it's appropriate for this to be asked. And it's been exacerbated by the recent economic woe uh, <clears throat> that, has, um, that Europe has suffered, along with the many other developed countries, leading some within Europe to argue that the model of capitalist liberal democracy itself is partly to blame for the crash. In that circumstance, the EU is re-examining its values in all sorts of fields, not just that on political conditionality. So this engagement with the EU, uh, with Turkey, is key in a number of areas. And the importance of the outcome of any eventual settlement will impact on several of the other issues that I'm also highlighting. As you can see on the board there, uh, <clears throat> secondly, we have EU citizenship. And the question of identity is a complex one in Europe. For at one and the same time, there are multiple competing factors which are all pulling in different directions at once. On the one hand, there is the rise in nationalist sentiment, which has triggered a series of swings to the political right in recent elections, including the most recent European Parliament elections in 2009. The prospect of federalism combined with the fear surrounding the impact of immigration on European culture have been twin facilitators in this shift. In practical terms, the advent of the Treaty of Lisbon and the earlier adoption of the Euro back in the early noughties has confronted the population with, <coughs> excuse me, with the prospect of a fully federalised Europe in a way that they hadn't fully appreciated before. For states that have a long history of separation and indeed armed conflict, this is something that a, the collective European psyche is grappling with and will be for some time to come. It's also important to note, perhaps surprisingly, that many of these European states, even the Western ones, are comparatively young themselves. As I mentioned earlier, Italy was created in 1865 and Germany in 1870. So the prospect of being amalgamated into a whole, when some might argue that they haven't had a chance to develop their full potential, is a very real source of anger for some. At the same time as the nationalistic factor exists, religion as a source of identity is also a major subject for debate. Clearly, this is primarily being discussed in relation to the Muslim populations on the continent, but the debates among them have also influenced internal debates within the Christian, Jewish and Hindu populations as well. This expresses itself in unusual ways. For example, the rise of non-Hindu religious populations in India has prompted significant contributions to the Hindutva parties there, such as the RSS and the BJP, to come uh, from the Gujarati population of Leicester in the UK. Thus, even though they are thousands of miles away from India and increasingly have been born and raised in the UK, there is still a religious affiliation that attaches the community to places which are completely outside of the EU. How do such loyalties and concerns feed into the conceptualization of a new European identity? At policy level, therefore, Commission personnel <coughs> are actively trying to bring religious groups into the consultations on the cultural shape of the new Europe. The inclusion of Article 17 mentioned earlier is one facet of that, but perhaps the most intense period of EU religious activity to date was in 2008. It was designated the European Year of Intercultural Dialogue, 
And during that year, all three institutions EU institutions were involved in organising various seminars, exhibitions and debates, many of which took place in formal settings such as the plenary sittings of the European Parliament itself, as well as during meetings of uh, official committees and delegations of the institution. Since then, the role of Sharia with the legal codes of individual states and the developing body of EU law has also become a major source of discussion particularly since the Archbishop of Canterbury's remarks in 2008, which were received very differently across different parts of Europe, uh, being roundly lambasted in uh, the UK, but were actually met with a good deal of, of interest and um, quite a warm reception in other parts of Europe. So there is a major discussion, particularly on the role of Sharia and the role of Sharia courts as well within the various uh, populations of Europe. <clears throat> there, have been, um, there have been attempts by some of the uh, councils in Europe to try and project a view of history that is much more inclusive than um, some of the viewpoints that have also been expressed. And one of the classic examples of that has been um, the British Council's project Our Shared Europe. Uh, which has sought to encourage dialogue and discussion on the place of Islam, as well as other religious groups within the EU. However, as yet, projects such as this one <coughs> are, um, are being I implemented to influence EU thinking, rather than as part of the EU itself developing a coordinated strategy. In relation to combating extremism, the EU has been very wary of engaging in this area, Active steps have been taken to ensure that any kind of anti-extremist language does not specifically target or be seen to be target, targeting Muslims alone. For that reason, the principal statement on this matter, uh, OJC 323E, European Parliament Resolution of 13th of December 2007, on combating the rise of extremism in Europe, deliberately avoids the mention of religious extremism alone, but also includes political extremism as well, particularly talking about the rise of the right, which I mentioned earlier. Since then, outside of the security units of the EU engaging in anti-terror intelligence gathering, the issue of anti-extremism has become embroiled with debates on religious defamation and discrimination. Individual EU states have developed strategies for combating the rise of extremism, which, in the main, have sought to target terrorism specifically, and has only recently and reluctantly sought to engage with the ideologies that lie behind it. The principal difficulty, as it is for any democracy, is balancing the freedom to have one's own beliefs against the possible threat to security that an ideology might pose. It is a question that the EU is only just on the edge of engaging with. And one of the key areas in relation to this anti-extremism uh, engagement has been specifically in relation to imam training. The French, who have traditionally stayed clear, as I mentioned earlier, of any kind of religious engagement, have in fact become religious, uh, have in fact become leaders in this area. Um, and they have um, sought to um, hold imam training at one of the senior Catholic universities just outside Paris. But it is an issue that is uh, prevalent and is of great concern uh, throughout uh, the EU. <clears throat> Thirdly, there is religious freedom. This is the area in which the European Union, one might say, has felt most comfortable in engaging with, because it engages in the area of human rights for which there is a legal basis. And in that regard, um, the Spanish in particular, uh, the Spanish Prime Minister, for example, Jose Luis Zapatero, um, in 2005, along with the Turkish Prime Minister, uh, Erdogan, launched the Alliance of Civilizations project which sought to uh, promote international, in, uh, intercultural, and interreligious dialogue and cooperation. 
and the alliance placed a high uh, emphasis on diffusing te tensions between Western and Islamic worlds. All 27 EU member states are members of the Alliance of Civilization Groups of Friends and supported UN Resolution 6414 on its establishment. There are two examples of the efforts of individual EU states in the area of religious freedom. The UK has made support for freedom of religious, religion or belief one of its strategic foreign policy goals on the basis that it is in the UK's strategic national interest to do so because religious freedom is often crucial to peace in society. It has also made the fight against religious extremism one of its key foreign policy goals. Thus, by default, the UK is engaging with religion in a way that it has not been seen to do for nearly a century. However, it's fair to say that this engagement is not in relation to education or research for re reasons of ethics or cultural understanding. It is, for the most part, in relation to combating radicalism and is very focused in that direction. To that end, the UK Foreign Office has produced or developed the Freedom of Religion or Belief Toolkit to support its network of diplomatic posts around this fundamental right. In Germany, the coalition, um, the CDU, the CSU and the FDP of the German government under Angelika Merkel, um, in their coalition agreement has contained a commitment to advocating religious freedom around the world and in the process pay particular attention to the condition of Christian minorities. This is viewed by the German Foreign Ministry as a basic task of a values-based foreign policy. A resolution adopted by the German Bundestag on 30th of June last year underlines that. It said, a positive religious freedom comprises the right to form and maintain a religion, to confess adhesion to one's religion and to live according to a religious conviction and join together in the form of religious communities. As yet, however, there has been little attempt to look at the role of religious considerations themselves when looking at foreign policy. Furthermore, the recent swings to the political right all over Europe have resulted in the swift inaction of some very draconian legislation at state level in relation to the wearing of the veil, the burqa, in public. Switzerland has also enacted legislation banning the building of mosque minarets over a certain height. So this concern over religious freedom, therefore, is balanced by the fears over the effects of immigration encapsulated in Muslim advocacy that is sweeping the con continent. Not surprisingly, therefore, concerns... Um, not surprisingly, therefore, concerns um, when you have religious freedom and... Um, how it operates with Muslim freedom of practice have been somewhat downplayed over the last 18 months and it's been left to the EU as an institution rather than individual member states to hold the battle. The EU has already been active on the issue of religious freedom. The European Parliament has held re regular plenary debates on the matter and has adopted a number of resolutions generally focusing on situations in particular countries where it's seen that abuses have taken place. And it's also worth noting the frequency with which individuals and groups working to defend religious freedom have been nominated by the European Parliament's Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought. Most recently, the Parliament adopted a resolution on the situation in Iraq, which underlined that hundreds of thousands of Christians had fled from the country in the face of repeated attacks against their communities and churches, and drew attention to the fact that a group which is part of al the Al-Qaeda movement has claimed responsibility for the killings and has vowed to launch further attacks against Christians. Of particular interest is the fact that it called upon the Vice President of the Commission and High Representative of the, of the um, EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Baroness Catherine Ashton, in view of the preparation of the first partnership and cooperation agreement with, between the EU and Iraq to address the problem of Christian safety within Iraqi borders as a priority issue. <clears throat> Since then, a number of resolutions have been banned uh, have been proposed and accepted by the Commission. And it is an area in which, if one might say, the, 
the Commission feels comfortable operating in relation to questions of um, religion and the interplay with government. <clears throat> However, these initiatives tend to be ad hoc and often in response to an urgent international situation, for example, the one discussed in Iraq. The day-to-day -day promotion of religious freedom around the world tends to be marginalised within the broader human rights framework, despite the fact that it is arguably the basis for a range of other freedoms. At a conference on freedom of religion or belief held in the European Parliament on 3rd of March 2010, the head of the French Foreign Ministry's religion team, Mr Joseph Malia, stated, a new intellectual frontier, that of the place of religion in international relations, has opened up before us. At the religions team, our objective is to serve French diplomacy by strengthening its appreciation of religion at international level and by ensuring that it is taken into consideration in our vision of the world. At the same conference the European, in the European Parliament, the representative of the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then Council President explained the rationale behind Spanish foreign policy interest. We cannot afford to turn a blind eye to the strength of religion at a moment when Iran, Afghanistan or Pakistan have become the centre of attention and when the deadlock in the Middle East process continues to spark rivalries, confrontation and even hatred amongst religious communities. It is safe to say, therefore, that there is an awareness of the importance of religion, not in and of itself, but in terms of its part in the cultural life of a state. Within that, the degree of religious freedom in the state has also recently been recognised as an effective indicator of the broader degree of freedom within that state. The Pew Report that was published in 2009, entitled Global Restrictions on Religion, um, talks about exactly that, that religion, religious freedom is a good indicator of um, other freedoms that are also exist within an individual country. But that said, the wider question of what does religious freedom really mean has not been tackled. In my own research, the uh, question of religious freedom has, was the route in for the inaction of the uh, 1937 government of India uh, Sharia Act, as it became known. Muslims at the time were arguing that <clears throat> under the 1858 proclamation of religious freedom by Queen Victoria, if freedom of religion was really the aim of the British government, then if Muslims were to practice being Muslims properly, then Sharia needed to be enacted as part of the civil code. So the concept of religious freedom became the basis for an inaction of Sharia within India. So defining what we mean by religious freedom is a discussion that is not even really properly started. And if necessary, I suspect will take some time to conclude before any further steps are taken. So what is the way ahead? One of the things I didn't talk about at the beginning, because I didn't feel that there were it's really time to do so, um, but I, I have a couple of slides which talk about the sort of differences between the EU institutions and things. Um, I, sort of, I, I assumed a certain level of knowledge, one might say. Um, but there is real struggle between the uh, European Parliament and the External Action Service uh, in relation to this question particularly. And because the External Action Service is so new, it's only just come online since the beginning of the year, sorry, end of last year. Um, it is very nervous about getting input from uh, parliamentary members and indeed other members of the Commission itself. And one might say, as a culture, the EEAS is very much of the um, laicite kind of variety insofar as uh, Baroness Ashton herself and her leading advisers are very uh, concerned to keep religion um, away from the policy-making levels. That said, um, there are movements within the EEA yes, to shift that, and the European Parliament itself is having some input into that. So, <clears throat> 
It is not just a question of whether it is right to do. It's also a question of who has what territory and who has the right to discuss these things. I mentioned some statistics to you at the beginning, uh, which argued that um, there was around about 70% uh, of Europe had some kind of religious belief. Um, <clears throat> but the statistics are very, very difficult to quantify. For example, um, according to uh, the European Union's latest statistics of um, 2009, there are around about 70.77% of the population of Europe is said to be Christian. But that doesn't sit very well with the, the parallel idea that um, some have argued in other studies that around about 45% of um, those in Europe are, have no real religion at all. They have no real belief in God. So the, the statistics are somewhat confused. Also, if you like, on at a straw poll level, some of the discussions that I've had with um, those who come from a Muslim background, particularly the younger Muslims that I've met, <coughs> in fact, um, many of them say that they are would either agnostic or they are atheists. So their parents have uh, Muslim names, they have Muslim names, but in terms of an actual belief, it is very hard to see where that directly impacts them. That said, in the studies done throughout Europe, consistently, Muslim populations in Europe count their religious identity much, much higher than uh, people from other faiths. That would include Hinduism, Judaism, and Christianity. So Islam as a form of identity, rather than necessarily as a, as a belief, is an interesting question in trying to discern the future. I've um, talked about religious freedom and the way forward on, on religious freedom is a very, very complex one and there's all sorts of inputs being uh, taken from not just Christians but also for uh, Muslim and Jewish sides as well. It is predominantly the monotheism faiths that uh, the European institutions are listening to at the moment. Um, <clears throat> And I would suspect that uh, any legislation in, in regard to uh, religious freedom would be a very, very long way from coming. But I think the real heart of the matter are these two that I mentioned below that, citizenship and Turkey, the issue of Turkey. Because how Europe sees itself and what it wants to say about itself going forward uh, in terms of its culture, in terms of its makeup and identity, I think are going to be um, key in establishing what view of religion is also taken within the EU institutions. And the advent of Turkey, as I say, the first sort of powerful uh, Muslim nation to become part of the EU, I think, is going to make a huge impact culturally on Europe as well. I put down there uh, women, and <clears throat> one of the things I haven't really had a chance to mention in my talk, I couldn't quite see how it fitted, but it's worthwhile flagging up is that the issue of uh, issues such as uh, shame and honor, the role of family the, uh, within Muslim societies and indeed other uh, societies as well within uh, Europe are actually, I think, going to be one of the major issues going forward as well because <clears throat> as um, there are now getting to the stage where, where uh, sort of third, fourth generation uh, Muslim women and Hindu women, etc., are getting to the stage when they want their own careers, the family life is, is not uh, sort of a given as it has been in the past. And so in terms of social, um, social effects, I think uh, what happens for women, if you like, within the European Union is going to have an, Im uh, an important cultural influence on uh, what happens going forward. Finally, I would say that <clears throat> Up till now, the uh, European Union's policy making as such in regard to religion is something that one might characterize as being sort of dragged into kicking and screaming. It is not something that it wants to do at all. And in general, it has been very reactive. However, over the last 
two years, possibly three, there has finally come the point where um, European leaders understand the necessity for more proactive engagement. And uh, the, as a consequence, um, people like myself, uh, those from uh, Muslim representation and, and others are now being asked to, into EU discussions in a way that they haven't really been done before that, despite the fact that the, uh, this has been a, a clear issue over the last sort of decade and more. So where will it end up going? Well, of course, that's hard to see, and it's intimately bound up in what Europe will want to say about itself anyway. But <clears throat> there are both internal uh, institutional factors which suggest that it is going to be, continue to be reactive for the moment rather than proactive, but that uh, if it learns the lessons of the past, it will hopefully move into a more proactive engagement with questions of religion. Thank you very much. I'll take your questions. Yeah. Um, one of the first statistics you gave was the immigration and um, the going and coming, and that uh, immigration in was like 6%, but people leaving was 13%. The people who are leaving, is there any understanding of why they're leaving and where they're going? Uh, yes. Um, in general, it's, it's um, one might say it, it's almost a, a replacement. It's a replacement of Europe uh, of one population by another. So a lot of one might characterise as uh, uh, white middle class people are emigrating and they're being replaced by by um, those who are coming in, in general, are either from the Eastern European states, so the um, Poles particularly have very large presence in many parts of Europe. Uh, also the Turks, 63% uh, of all Muslims in, in Turkey, um, so in Germany, are from a Turkish background. Um, <clears throat> or they're coming from uh, South Asia, but less so from South Asia now as the uh, Indian economy particularly uh, develops. And many more, actually, are from India are choosing to go come here to the States instead. So, as I said, I think it's more of a replacement in one sense rather than the same people coming in and then going out again. Although there has been some of that, particularly during, during the boom years. Uh, thank you for your, your, your talk. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll limit it to two for now. Okay. Um, so first question is, what are your thoughts about uh, American policy making in a similar fashion? Um, America, I think, is a little bit behind in terms of its relationship with the Muslim world. And so what, what do you see the nuances are over here? Um, the second question has to do with, and I think you've addressed it, I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, the real issue being not so much the identity of the religious the religious immigrants coming in, but really more the identity of a integrated Europe of the future. Because there's, there's a two-way dialogue of civilization, so we're expecting the immigrants to come and adopt a certain uh, set of norms, but at the same time they're bringing, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, communication or, or, or benefits to the, to the host nation, and how much do they, do, they, do they take? So I think how much of this is a Europe and the future that is that has to change as much as it's asking its immigrants to change. Fine. Um, <clears throat> U.S. policy making. Um, in one sense, I wouldn't like to uh, say too much, but you see the big difference between Europe and the U.S. Um, in fact, Philip Jenkins pointed this out in his uh, book *God's Continent*, uh, which looked at Europe. Um, <clears throat> is that? In the main, immigration to the U.S. has been Christian, so it's come from Latin America. Uh, I mean, it's come from the other part, other parts of the world too, but it's been in much smaller numbers. Whereas, in the main, for the Europeans, because of their former colonial ties and things, um, it, immigration has been mainly either Muslim or it's been Hindu or so a very different sort of set of cultural norms. So, engaging in those uh, questions 
is it's difficult to make comparisons because the set of circumstances in the US is very different to that in the UK. I think the other thing to say about the US is that, in general, um, <clears throat> the Muslim populations here generally tend to be at the wealthier end um, rather than those in Europe, who quite often, I mean, unemployment rates and, and things like that has consistently shown to be very high amongst Muslim populations within Europe as compared to other populations. So there is a sort of difference of expectation as well uh, here, and, and the aspirations, I suppose one might say, of the immigrants who come here. So I think for those two reasons, um, you're dealing with very, very uh, different situations. And of course, you have uh, the examples of, of the um, pastor down in Florida and, and what he's doing and causing such angst, of course, in um, Afghanistan as well. Um, <clears throat> you have a, 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 a policy, I suppose you might say, a, a perception that is coloured by the 9-11 attacks and, of course, also the engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan as well. So um, I would say that... Um, U.S. policy making is is both in connection with its is mainly in connection, I think, with its foreign policy rather than its internal policies at the moment. Um, and but for Europe, because of the immediacy of the immigration and the numbers in immigration, the issue is far more to do with internal rather than external. So it's coming at it from two different points of view. It's probably not a very satisfactory answer, but that's. That would be my perception anyway. Uh, in relation to uh, integrated Europe, yes, um, the sort of assimilation integration argument is, is, a, is a, a major one. And <clears throat> one might say that the Archbishop of Canterbury's remarks uh, in 2008 were a sort of classic example of that. He, he was arguing that almost of a necessity, they would need to be some kind of uh, integration rather than assimilation. And most of the British newspapers turned around and probably said that it was assimilation or nothing at all. Uh, and the French particularly have had a very strong policy on assimilation rather than integration. The, um, I would say that Western Europe is in a different kettle of uh, fish to Eastern Europe, insofar as Eastern Europe, of course, particularly the Balkans, has had a um, long history of either being under Ottoman rule or a, or a closer engagement with Islam in general because of the populations that were living around, say, the Caucasus areas as well. Um, in Western Europe, <coughs> um, the, uh, the Spanish have been uh, very keen to promote a uh, Pacific idea of, of Islam and to integrate as far as possible their, their um, uh, Moroccan uh, the people coming from Morocco into into Spain. Um, the French have had some, some, definitely a, a love-hate relationship, and the suburbs of, of Paris have become the subject of quite detailed studies uh, in relation to how um, the what effectively have become ghettos of, of Muslim immigrants from North Africa particularly interact with the rest of French society. The separatism issue has become a major issue because you see the same kind of thing in, um, <clears throat> in uh, UK and in Germany as well. So uh, moving out from a, a separatist idea and moving away also from uh, separate educational strands as well, which has also been an issue uh, in much of the UK and the rest of Europe. Um, <laughs> in one sense, it depends which EU official you talk to. Uh, as to where they stand on the assimilation integration debate. Um, but broadly speaking, I would say the conclusion at the moment is because of the political swing in Europe, most people are talking about assimilation rather than integration. But at the same time, for example, things like imam training are recognizing the need that Muslims who are born and brought up in Europe need people to teach them who are relevant to their cultural background. And at the moment, that is not the case in a lot of cases, and it will help, they think, with integration in the longer term. I hope that answers your question. We can talk later as well, perhaps. Any others?
You spoke a bit about the issue of uh, brokers and failing. Yeah. Uh, can, can you explain a bit about uh, to what degree you feel that um, it is a uh, religious issue as opposed to a cultural issue? Mm -hmm. um, it's my understanding that there is some uh, debate about whether it is truly a religious issue per se. Yes. <laughs> well, in one sense, um, it's one of the big problems is knowing where culture ends and religion begins uh, for populations who call themselves Muslim, as I was saying earlier. Uh, uh, and, for example, many of the younger generation might not be Muslim at all. They might be atheist in practice, but are still under the Muslim umbrella. So to what extent culture takes, a pl uh, takes part and to what extent religion as such takes part is, is hard uh, to answer. But certainly the... Um, the issue of, of the headscarf or the, the full covering um, really came out of um, uh, France. Um, there was in the suburbs of Paris. There was a, a school teacher who essentially uh, reprimanded uh, two of her school children for um, wearing religious items in school. One of them uh, was Jewish. She was wearing a, a, a Jewish star, Star of David. And the other was a Muslim girl who was wearing the headscarf. And when it got reported, it was the headscarf that was talked about all the time. The uh, Star of David wasn't talked about at all. And to me, the real the sort of underlying issue under it was, in, a, in one sense... It was, it was the spark that ignited the public-private debate question. Uh, the role of religion in, in public had been, as I mentioned in my talk, something that the French had been vehemently against for uh, you know, two centuries. And so the idea of what was public and what was private in terms of religion lay at the core of that uh, debate. And since then... Uh, the Italians have gone the, the same way, the uh, Belgians have gone the same way. And in fact, um, there is some talk of um, a bill going through the British Parliament as well, uh, talking about the same thing. My feeling is, and in many senses I hope, because I think it's very reactionary legislation, that um, <clears throat> this will be the sort of the high watermark of an antagonism and it will begin to recede again. Um, but I think it's been a catalyst um, for a debate that has been wanting to happen in Europe, but has been sort of suppressed. The role of religion in public, I think, that little wearing of the headscarf was the trigger that, it came, that brought it out in public. And it concerns much, much wider things than just simply that one veil. Does that answer your question? Thanks. If there's no one else, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. proceed. Um, so the first question is, I guess, or more around the internal struggle between, um, shall we say, native Europeans in terms of integration simulation. I noticed that you've done a lot of research on the, the Salafist movement and other groups. Are you finding that the Muslim immigrants have responded intellectually to, to building a European identity? Or are they uh, also debating, uh, assimilate, separate? So are you finding that same, uh, have you found the Muslim intellectual intelligence actually uh, meeting the challenge in, in, in Europe? Or are, do they need to do their homework as well? Um, I think it's, <clears throat> I mean, as, as with any of these things, you, you ask different Muslim groups and you get different answers in one sense. Um, have you heard of uh, Tariq Ramadan over, over here? Um, Tariq Ramadan is generally reckoned to be the, the foremost um, Muslim scholar in Europe. His books are very widely read, not just amongst the Muslim communities, but um, broader than that as well. He has argued uh, that <clears throat> the future... A development of Islamic theology is going to happen within Europe because there's such a melting pot of different Muslim groups within it, the confines of the continent that it cannot help but begin to fuse a new 
kind of Islamic theology. And so in that respect, it's, a, a, it's an interesting time. Um, I think th what, um, there are organizations such as the FIOE, um, <clears throat> Federation of uh, Islamic Organizations in Europe, which are trying in much the same way that um, I mentioned the um, 1937 Sharia Act, trying to create a sim single Muslim identity for all Europeans and to make themselves essentially the voice for those Europeans. And in the main, those overtures have been resisted. They've published things like the European Muslim Charter, which they've said has been signed by over 400 different groups. Um, but the extent uh, to which their support is really widespread amongst uh, other European Muslim groups is a matter of some debate. I would say that individual Muslim groups would be much more wedded to national sentiment rather than European sentiment. Um, and the idea of a collective European understanding, whether it's Muslims or anybody else, is some way off. But I think the interesting thing um, is that the debates that are happening in European Muslim circles, Muslim intellectual circles, are actually sparking similar debates within Christian circles particularly and also within uh, Hindu and to some extent Sikh um, circles as well. So what is happening in the Islamic Europe is becoming a catalyst for a number of other groups that are also asking themselves what it means to have a faith within another identity as well. So do you think that um, in, in Britain uh, the Muslim population is integrated uh, much better than in other uh, European countries? For example, you know, in, in, the, in the House of Lords we've got three Muslim uh, lords now. Mm -hmm. The last one's Tariq Ahmed, yeah. the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Mm -hmm. And then of course we've got Baroness Borsi, which is a member of the you know, conservative government. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, do you, do you think that uh, the cultural, not cultural dynamics, but, you know, people who immigrated from other Muslim countries, like in East Africa, you had a mass migration of Indians, that included Muslims, mm -hmm. from India and Pakistan, you know. Do you think it's because of Britain's relationship with those countries, which were amicable, really, mm -hmm. um, after independence? as compared to, you know, with France and, you know, uh, North African countries. I think there, there are differences. As, again, it's, it's a question of which individual Muslim community you really are talking about, with, even within the UK, because there are some Muslim communities, I would argue, that, that are more integrated simply because one might say either they're a, a Pacific outlook or... Um, 70%, perhaps you're aware, 70% of the Muslims in the UK come from one region, uh, the Mirpuri region, uh, um, Pakistan, uh, India border. And um, <clears throat> I would say that many of those would be more integrated, although the sort of, in one sense, the ghettoization hasn't done the many favours in terms of uh, integrating into the rest of society, and it's a two-way thing. There have been rejections by the host society as well, of course. Um, I would say that there's a greater problem with the um, the uh, East African communities, uh, notably the uh, Somali community. Um, I think there is a there is a greater problem there than there is with the Mirpuri community. So it it depends, in one sense, which one you're talking about. But the French had such a different policy when it came to their colonial states as the British had in relation to theirs. Uh, classic example, the 1865 Senatus Consulti um, said that <clears throat> for all subjects living in Tunisia or Albania, uh, Albania Algeria, that um, <clears throat> a Muslim, if they wanted to become a French citizen, had to renounce Sharia. They could become a French national and remain under Sharia, but if they wanted to become a full French citizen, they had to renounce Sharia put themselves consciously under 
um, Western or French, in this case, civil law. So there are things like that historically that have made it harder for Muslims, I think, to integrate in France than they have done in the UK. But as I said, it's not generalised at national level. I would say it would be smaller community level than that. Well, I guess um, we have a reception outside, and so perhaps we can continue with an informal discussion out there. Um, thank you. I think, unfortunately, the national championship basketball game drew away um, many of our students, which is quite unfortunate they missed out tonight. But thank you for attending. Um, thank you again to Mr. Party and the Bonnie Center for helping the Baker Institute Student Forum put on this event. And um, thank you most of all to our speaker, um, Dr. Oliver D.